weeks from today in Soccer We Trust YouTube family, we are kicking off against Wales in a World Cup. So let's talk about what happened this past weekend on this very special Halloween episode with all of our players and, of course, Charlie, Frankie Haydick, Davies, and I don't know what Heath is wearing. After you hit like and subscribe, of course, vamos! Yes! What is up, everybody? Welcome to Bobby Convy's favorite podcast in Soccer We Trust. <laughs> I'm Jimmy Trash Can, Cream Cheese, Connor King of Conrad, <laughs> alongside Charlie Chuck Wagon. I think he's looking like Frankie Haydook and Alexi Lawless had a baby Davies and Hollywood Heath Pierce in a fantastic wig. And today, fellas, on this Halloween, we are exactly three weeks away from playing in our first World Cup game in over eight years. That is wild. Now, I just want to remind everybody what was happening in 2014. That was the year that the Ice Bucket Challenge went down. Derek Jeter retired mm -hmm. from baseball. Vine was mm -hmm. still a thing. Uh, the debut of the Serial podcast. Uh, Frozen came out and everybody was singing Let It Go. I might still sing it every once in a while. Dr. Dre sold beats to Apple for $3 billion to become the richest man in hip-hop. And YouTube stars really went mainstream that year with main YouTuber PewDiePie raking in more than $4 million a year. Obviously, Mr. Beast is probably the guy now. And most of the players in our current national team were just starting their teenage years or were pre-teens. Dreaming of maybe playing in a World Cup one day, and now we are three weeks away. It doesn't feel real, Heath. What are your thoughts on, mm -hmm. on where we are? We're so close to the finish line of us getting to play in a World Cup again. Well, when you said uh, over eight years, I immediately was like, yeah, that can't be right. And then you just actually put it into context, and you're like, yeah, it's over eight years. Uh, because, you know, Qatar decided to move it to the winter, and uh, the U.S. failed in 2018. So uh, it's been a long time and uh, Jimmy was a rising YouTube star at that time, uh, uh, by the way. Uh, he was well on his way with uh, Kick TV to, 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 to growing uh, uh, the, the subscriber base to over a million, which at the time was, was, was pretty wild for, it, for a channel that wasn't just one uh, individual creator by itself. Jimmy, I wanted to reference that, man. That's Thank what, you very much. You know, you I, I, also, root, wanna, I also want to say shout out to Pete Frades from Boston College, who kind of spurred on the Ice Bucket Challenge from a for ALS. So. Shout out to um, Pete Frazier and rest in peace. I mean, what he's been able to do for for the research of ALS has been incredible. So, yeah, I mean, and we're back, baby. It's Halloween. It's Monday, <laughs> and I'm vibing. Let's let's get into this. And you know, we got to touch on a number of things. Austin Trusty is one that I want to get into. Okay, we'll uh, get into, into it. With you. We'll get okay. into it. But let's start with the scary stuff first because it is Halloween, and. The scariest thing is that Weston McKinney is hurt. He is apparently yes. going to be out for two weeks with a thigh injury that he suffered in the first half of Juventus's eventual 1-0 win over Lecce. A big win for them, obviously, to, to kind of keep uh, Maxi Allegri in the job. Uh, Charlie, I'll throw it back to you. Your thoughts on, on Weston McKinney and, and what we do, because this actually might force our hand to go with a Gio Reyna centrally, because if McKinney's out, we got De La Torre out. Malik mm -hmm. Tillman, do we do we trust Malik Tillman to no. start the first game against Wales? So no. why not go with a Gio Reyna or a Brendan Aronson uh, in that central spot, and and that will free up another opportunity to bring on you know start a team away who started this one. We'll get into all the players, but what are your thoughts on Weston McKinney, Charlie? Yeah, it's un it's unfortunate. I mean, this is a, a big part of our team. Uh, think about the set pieces and aerial duels and challenges, and and in factoring with him out in, in the starting eleven. It does provide an opportunity for Gio Reyna, who I think would would be the guy to play if he's healthy and fit, and you can depend on him. At, and we wouldn't know that until the first game. Yeah. But that's a great opportunity for for Gio Reyna to slide in centrally with Yunus Musa, which I'd love to see. Maybe Yunus Musa drops deeper, more of an an eight now, mm -hmm. and Reyna has that freedom, which he talked about with us. I love that free role in him in the midfield. He can go left, he can float right, he can be central create some mismatches and overloads on the left or the right with Timo Weah. I, it's not the worst thing. It, it's it's not great because he's Weston McKinney is so important to this team, but he will be back for the World Cup. But in terms of but that sharpness, first game, though. what about yeah, sharpness? in terms of that first game, maybe it's Gio Reyna that starts that first game with Yunus Musa and, and Tyler Adams. So, you know, with an injury so, comes opportunity. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, I think that's how all of us kind of break into the national team at some point, right? Somebody mm -hmm. drops off, somebody gets hurt, and we get our chance, and then we take it, and then it becomes ours for a little while until we get hurt and somebody takes our spot. That's just the way it goes. But, Heath, 
the certainties I think that we've had around this national team, we got death, we got taxes, we got MMA starting for us in the World Cup. And now one of the M's looking like he might not be as fit or sharp as we'd like him to be heading into this game. Three weeks from now, I still can't believe that in three weeks we'll be in the middle of the U.S. taking on Wales. That is, I still, I'm trying to really wrap my head around that. But but do you think that Giorena, would you, what would you do ultimately at this point? Knowing that you're going to get him back with a week left to go, can you round him into form, into a form that is going to be competitive? Do you bring him on as a super sub? We've seen him be a super sub before for us. I don't know. I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting. Wait, are you, are you saying are you saying McKinney or or or, or Reina in that context? McKinney. No, no, Reina. Did, okay. Yeah, Reina. Yeah, didn't I start mean, this weekend, but I, but I've talked. Let's talk no, McKinney I'm, specifically. Yeah, McKinney. It's hard because it's about reps and minutes. I mean, obviously, if he's able to play like like Charlie had said last week, uh, almost like he he knew something we didn't, which was like if you can do forty five, you can do sixty. We saw that with Bedoya go a little more than sixty. Charlie just asked him, and he said that exact thing, and then Charlie used it as some sort of. Uh, some sort of expertise of like, if you can do 45, you can do 60. Turns out Charlie just talks to Alejandro Bedoya on a regular basis. So it wasn't that uh, <laughs> much of an expert opinion. Honestly, uh, Charlie. We, we didn't even talk about it. Don't lie, dude. He came out right after that, you know, like this, Charlie this, knew, like, yeah, you know, weird. this is a, we know it's a fact. It's the captain yeah, of the team. True. If I put myself yeah. in his shoes, if I can play, I'm telling the coach, you start me and we see how long I can go. But I'm not coming off the bench in a playoff game to get to MLS Cup. You start me. And we we knew that's how Alejandro Bedoya's mentality was coming into this. He was hobbling, though, when they did the trophy lift. Oh, so I'm wondering he if, he's, if he's uh, banged up for the final. But um, yeah. we'll he, see. Oh, he's, he's got not, a week he's to figure it out. Final. But, but, but with Weston McKinney, uh, you know, you hope that he can be on, on the field. But that's an opportunity. When you think about Gio Reyna, though, my, my issue with that front three, and, and I want your guys to take on this. Would you rather have Gio Reyna on the wing or in the middle with regard to how we press, right? Because Charlie mentioned all the things of uh, going to find the ball in good spaces. But if we are going to come out against Wales and put them under pressure and try to press them in a way that I think has made us successful at times, where would you rather have him? Would you have Brendan Aronson on the field? Just in terms of Gio Reyna, great. When we have the ball drifting into spaces, creating overloads, all those kinds of things. But Gio Reyna is also not our best presser of the ball. Um, and if he can just be predictable, I don't care where he is, you know, in terms of like, if you know he's going to press when transition happens, because he does it at Dortmund, press the first ball right away. Where does it help us most in our transition game? Because when I look at our team and our ability to beat anybody, the thing that's our most dangerous attack of all the things that I've seen is literally our our, our ability to win the ball in transition and do something quickly there versus break him down through passing or or playing direct or any of those things. Haven't I haven't seen us consistently do that. I think our mm -hmm. best attack is our is, is our our defense in, in high areas. I, I I will just say that I think we're we're superior to Wales. I think we will have more possession than Wales. And in those in those instances, that's where Gio Reyna is going to be a big asset to the US men's national team in keeping possession and breaking them down. I think they're going to be more defensive than people are anticipating. We're a better side than Wales. We have better players than Wales. Gareth Bale is not Gareth Bale of 2015, 16, 17, 18. This is Gareth Bale who, who can't even play for LAFC because of injury, not because of anything else. He's just not healthy enough. So how can Wales rely on Gareth Bale for three matches in the World Cup, 90 minutes? It's not happening. No chance. So Tony, that's why I'm like getting this feeling that Charlie's costume doesn't match his tone. Charlie, you should be all right. Slower. <laughs> you need to be a lot more chill. Dude. Come on. I'm gonna I feel chill like you're out really there. wound right. up. You're really wound up for a guy that looks like that. Hey, if, all right. If, well, you, you, you tried to fire me up, and now I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna yeah, ride the go. wave. All right. I, I Fine, feel, I feel sure, like bro. maybe if if he's trying to channel Frankie Hayduk, then maybe he's on a sixth espresso. Uh, Heath. Uh, what, what I find interesting is if if G Arena is too, bro. The player, the player that steps in for us and gets plays that number 10 spot, his responsibility against Wales to get specific will be to potentially sit. They play in a 3-4-2-1. So, so he's gonna have to figure out a way to sit on their the best playmaker out of that that, that who, next line of four. If that's mind, Ampadu, that? Ethan Ampadu, or he's or, not a playmaker. Right, right. I don't, so I don't care be what get, to do. He's not a playmaker. No, they got a bunch of guys that are gonna work, they're gonna fight, and they're gonna make it difficult. And that's what we're gonna have to fight through. And when we played Japan and Saudi Arabia, just to use our most two recent examples, we did struggle with teams that had a lot of players in that 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 channel of the field, the middle channel, the middle block, and and so I I, I don't mind Geo there, but but that means Moose is going to have to drop a little bit deeper. And and it's interesting that 
that could be something that could unlock our offense because this is something we've been asking for for a while where can we get more of our better attacking players on the field with all due respect mm-hmm. to Weston McKinney or, or Eunice Musa, the guys Gio Reyna Timo Way, I think is going to start on the right. He had 70 minutes in his first start of the season against Lyon uh, this weekend. They ended up losing one zero, but um, nothing that he could have done about that particular goal. But I think he's going to start. I think Christian's on the other side. And then it looks like I would say Pepe at this point is probably yes, going to be our starter. Agreed. Sergeant still, he, Sergeant didn't play this weekend for, for Norwich. His coach at Norwich, Josh Sargent. Dean he didn't Smith, dress. The coach he didn't dress. Didn't, didn't dress. Basically, uh, Dean Smith, the coach of Norwich, said, we know that he's trying to get on the World Cup team. We're trying to be, essentially trying to be thoughtful. I'm paraphrasing now, but just trying to be thoughtful about this aspiration for him. And so that's that's an interesting, and, and I, I, I'm glad that Dean Smith is, is taking so that he must have been beat up. He must have been been like obviously they 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 need him, but the, he must have been beat up a little bit. Then I'm assuming like some sort of little knock that he's nursing. Right, um, right, right. So the you only would never just question. like undress your player. That sounds weird. You would never yeah. not dress your your, <laughs> your, your you, you would never yeah yeah you would never <laughs> you would never just you would never undress not dress your player. Yeah. So yeah, so that's so true also, but. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess the big question, and then if if we don't trust Bro. Tillman to be the guy, which it sounds like we don't, then then it's either Brendan Aronson or or Gio Reyna in that spot. For me, those are the two options. I kind of like Brendan Aronson as a super sub. I know that, uh, but but I do yeah, also. Dang. He does he does fit that, and and Gio's been coming off the bench for Dortmund as he did this past weekend for 29 minutes in Dortmund's two one win over Eintracht in Frankfurt. Pretty big win for them. So he has been doing both roles. He's doing a little bit of starting. He's doing a little bit of coming off the bench, still trying to make an impact on either side. So I think either one of those guys can be comfortable, but I guess maybe it does come down to the pressing. What do you want from that spot? Aronson's going to give you a different type of energy and and pressing than Gio will, but Gio maybe that little bit of that quality where he can do and bring more players into the game than maybe Brendan can. I, I don't know. Uh, Charlie, come to you. If if right now, if you had a choice, say McKenney's out, not ready to go for Wales, do you go with Rainer or do you go with Brendan Aronson centrally as the number 10? I'm going with the dude who's most, <laughs> most gifted on the ball. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Gio as long as he can like <laughs> stay healthy and all. Like I don't see anything wrong with Gio just like getting on the ball and dictating the tempo and stuff. So for me, it's like better having Aronson come in like as a super sub. Like you you gotta insinuate you can, can you switch characters twelve minutes in. I don't know if you well, can. Well, yeah, bro. Yeah. yeah. Jeez, for the viewers, they get it. For the listeners, now. they are freaked out right now. You know? The listeners so have no like, idea. Yeah, well, they, don't know, they and... don't know the vibes here. Charlie's, Charlie's taking edibles uh, mid, mid-podcast. Hey, <laughs> hey, I'm just saying, man. <laughs> like, free the people. I'm going to say uh, that. Uh, really, dude. He, took the, he took the yellow pill with a smiley face on it. Dude, all right, I'm all just right. saying, you got to <laughs> go with Raina. Right all right, dude? <laughs> Keith, how about you? Who, who do you go with? Or and, and give me two, I guess, two answers. Who do you, who do you go with? And then who would Greg... You think Greg will go with in this instance if if, if Weston's not available? I I just have trouble uh, thinking about game one, uh, not having Brendan Aronson as a starter on your team in terms of the way you want to press. Take Brendan Aronson off after sixty if the game settles in and he's not being effective in the team's press. I I just find it hard to not have him on the field, which makes it a a tough one because I think we need I need think we need team away. We've seen that we've been missing him when he's not on. Uh, and then it, it comes down to Brendan Aronson or, or Gio Reyna. I think they start. See, this is where I'm stuck. Uh, but I just don't see a world in which Brendan Aronson is not starting in game one, maybe game two. Um, but I guess you go Gio Reyna at the 10 spot. I like Gio Reyna floating in there. I like him much more than being out on the wing because if we can't get him the ball in good spots, we've seen when he's in, when he gets the ball in good spots, how he's one of, he's one of our best, if not our best at attacking, maybe Christian Pulisic on his day is better. Uh, at combination play, but Gio Reyna helps to connect those lines better than I think anybody else is. And I don't want Brendan Aronson really at the 10. I don't think he's, I don't think he's effective enough over long periods at the 10 yet to, 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 to warrant that as a starting position over Gio Reyna. Well, just to remind everybody in our game against Morocco. Now I do take into consideration Morocco flew over to the United States 48 hours before kickoff and probably looked a little jet lagged. Uh, but we beat them 3-0. Our starting lineup for that one up top was Jesus Ferrer at the nine, Timo Weah on one side, Pulisic on the other. Brendan Aronson in the midfield with Tyler Adams and Yunus Musa. We win that one 3-0. And, and Aronson had a good game and looking for that combination play. That's I just want to throw that out there because we have at least that that historical reference of, of these guys playing together in this situation and it turning into a positive result for us. So something to keep in mind. Well, I, I Go would ahead. say... I, 
when you saw Brent Aronson play against Liverpool, what what was your your thought as far as how he's he was kind of getting involved and the spots where he felt he was making a difference because it wasn't central. It was more coming in on the the wings mm-hmm. and finding those spots. And one thing I, I am so proud and excited about is Tyler Adams and his progression because the man was an absolute beast against the very best in in Liverpool. I mean, are you kidding me with his performance in that match? Yeah, yeah. Dude, it was like epic. It was like far out. <laughs> mm-hmm. So so before we move on to the Leeds boys, including Jesse Marsh, let's just want to say that Weston McKinney now joins an injured list on the scary side of things with Serginho Dest, who's still out for AC Milan. Matt Turner, who's still nursing a growing injury. De La Torre is going to be a World Cup. I'm curious to see what, what Greg does with him because he probably won't be ready uh, until like kickoff. He's I think he's still three weeks out. And then Josh Sargent, of course, uh, nursing a calf injury. I think he'll be ready to go. It's just a matter of precautionary, but still obviously on the injured list currently at the moment. So something to keep in mind. All right, let's pivot now to Leeds and then beating Liverpool at Anfield for the first time in 21 years, which I think gave uh, Jesse Marsh a little bit of a longer leash, especially with their fans. I think the board and the players obviously seem like they're behind him. The board already came out and said they got his back. That sometimes can be the kiss of death. The players put out a performance that clearly had their managers back and and uh, such a big win and big thrill for those guys to do that. And to your point, Charlie, Tyler Adams was immense. Jesse Marsh came out after the game and said every time that he has played for Leeds, he's one of our best players. And I think this was another example of that. And his progression continues to impress. And now I'm not surprised, nor was I surprised, that Manchester United have come out and expressed interest and potentially signing him moving forward. He's just he's just got the goods. He, he does the work. He covers the ground. He's a good leader. I would say in some ways, Heath, he's a bit like Jude Bellingham in terms of his his presence on the field. They're not like-for-like like players, of course. I think Jude Bellingham's obviously a little bit better going forward. But, but there's something about how they carry themselves and that they've got this winning mentality. And I think that permeates to everybody around them. Expects and has that expectation that everybody else's game is going to raise too. What, what say you on that? I mean, we've all been on, it, it goes back to that classic of like starting the game, winning the first challenge, winning the first 50, 50. When you have somebody like that and, and you've been around it, sometimes we've all started slow. When you have somebody that can get the team going, that creates that energy around you. I do think that's infectious on a good day and on a bad day to like write, writing things, having that type of energy. And that's typically been uh, your, your, I mean, Charlie was an example of a high energy guy that could get you into the games as well, but generally you have your six right? Who's, who's that one that's willing to chase cover ground, put in the big tackle, the challenge early and sort of be that central part of, 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 of 11 players in that, in that middle part of the field. And so he, he really fits that bill of somebody that can make players around them better, not just in his, in his passing or willingness to do the work, but that energy around you that makes you believe or get your sort of self going into a match. And I think, again, when I think about him on the national team, We've always placed him as as sort of maybe not the number one in our roster because of his quality, but because he's irreplaceable for a number of things, right? Uh, one, we don't have another six. Two, just his ability to cover ground and have that sort of energy that the team needs. And you look throughout our national teams in the past, and we've always had somebody that can be that energy that lifts the team around them, um, that stands out, whether you're a fan watching or whether you're on the field with him. Okay, so Charlie, here, here's my – I just want to add this wrinkle to your answer about Tyler Adams and your thought about him in particular. Do you feel like – because it's obviously being proven with Leeds and with when he was with RB Leipzig as well, that there's a high-pressing situation, which I think plays to Tyler's strengths. But at some point in, in each game, even if it's Iran, even if it's Wales, we know we're going to suffer a little bit against England. They're going to have more of the possession, or that's how it, it feels like it's going to play out on paper. Do you feel like he has the discipline – and I know that he does, but I just want to just in terms of having it where because he just has to stay home. Sometimes we just need him to stay home in front of our mm-hmm. back four because if he gets out too wide, that's going to create gaps because he's just trying to make plays. This is all good intentions in how he plays and what he's trying to do. But I wonder what we look like, because at some point I want us to have that fluidity in our team shape where, OK, we can't press right now. How comfortable are we with being uncomfortable and and not having the ball and, and Tyler being the one dictating everything? I just I want to throw say, that in there. Yeah, I, I would say, have, have you seen the U.S. be be <laughs> disciplined and, and, and staying home? Because I, I haven't. Uh, for Tyler Adams, 
we're, we're accustomed to seeing him cover for Serginho Dest, Antti Robinson, and having to get out there because those players are out of position. I think in the World Cup, Greg has to hammer home to Dest and Antti Robinson in particular that they need to stay at home and defend at times and be a little bit more defensive minded instead of, I know they love to get forward. I know they provide the width, but now I want you to sit a little bit more and allow Timo Weah and Pulisic to, to keep the width for the team and give them their space. Don't clap. Don't clog it up on those wide areas. And that's where Tyler Adams can be more disciplined and stay more central. But as, as those outside backs keep getting up and down and up and down, that's when he has to cover. And he's an absolute beast. He reminds me more of a, N'Golo Kante, Claude Makaleli, that that's where Tyler Adams fits best because those players can cover so much ground and get it off their feet quickly and 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 more effort the the less effort they have to play in terms of getting on the ball and, and building out of the back. Tyler has that in his locker. Sometimes I think he relies on it a little too much of being a pure low when less is more. Win the ball, mm-hmm. get it off your foot, and, and allow Gio Reyna, Christian, if, if you can play through the lines quicker, that's when you can hit him in those transition moments. So Tyler is is the most important player for this team. That, that's not for, that, for me, that's not even a question. Just because of how much he does for the group, winning the challenges, being the, the leader and the role model for, for performances, but also off the field. He just has that, he carries that, mm-hmm. that I, I don't know, persona with him that everyone goes, all right, he's our guy. We're going to follow him through this, into this battle. I, I, I think it's almost, that criminal seems pretty dramatic, but it, it feels... There's no other choice for being captain of the U.S. men's national team. Like, it's just Tyler Adams. Now, you don't need a thin piece of cloth around your arm to be a captain, but I would like him to be the captain throughout the World Cup. That's my vote for that. Now, I love the points that you make about how he's got to cover for Anthony Robbins or Junior Dest, Charlie. I think that's spot on. I worry about Dest, right? Because we're tick, 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 getting closer and closer. But it's also strategic risk. I mean, it's strategic risk, though, you know? He played 45 minutes yesterday. Okay. Yeah, okay. But, Mm -hmm. but. I just want to make sure he's sharp the whole, you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? But yeah. you, you also, as the as the resident fullback here, there is some strategic risk at times to knowing that you have some cover, right? Knowing that you want to be, if you play neutral all the time, it's really hard to beat anybody. But if right, when you right. have your moments, like Charlie had said, pick and choose your moments and, and staying back defensively. If you do see that there's a weakness on a certain side and you want to cheat up forward a little bit, knowing that you have a, a Tyler Adams, instead of getting... Uh, whether that's Cameron Carter Vickers or Aaron Long or Walker Zimmerman pulled out to the sidelines, which is the worst place that we want them, or pulled into the midfield is the worst place we want them. Having somebody like that that can come out and put out a fire from time to time is really crucial two, three times in a match, you know, when you are exposed or there's a bad turnover, because you can be in good spots high and wide, but if there's a bad turnover, you need somebody that can be able to track track back and put out those fires. No, no, that's a, that's a good point. And, uh, it was nice to see Serginho Des come off the bench against Torino. They needed they needed something that he brings. And I'm glad that Stefano Pioli, the manager of Milan, trusts him in that capacity. I think that's obviously very important. I just, I just, he just hasn't had a lot of minutes over the last, let's say, five or six months. And, and I hope that he can find that, especially as we get we get closer. Now, let's talk about um, well, there's a whole bunch of players we can talk about. I I I wonder with regard to Mark McKenzie. I'm mm. going to throw it here because we had Mark McKenzie and Eric Palmer Brown. I know they're battling for maybe that third or fourth spot uh, at, at center back, potentially maybe even second, How based on how Greg is looking at this. We can throw Austin Trusty in this too as well, Charlie, because I know you want to talk about him. Mm-hmm. McKenzie, 90 minutes, uh, starting again for Gank in their 3-1 win. They're top of the table. It's their eighth straight win. That, I think, has to be taken into consideration. Eric Palmer Brown just played against uh, Paris Saint-Germain, against Messi, Mbappe, and Neymar. There's only so much you can do. I thought it was a good opportunity. He didn't play poorly, but I thought it was a good opportunity for him to say, hey, I shut those guys down. They were in my back pocket. They were up 2-1, Twa. And then, of course, uh, Messi doing messy things. The guy's unreal right now. And, and they come back and storm back and score a couple goals, and they went 4-2. to two. So Twa loses, and I think maybe Eric Palmer Brown loses his opportunity as well. But Austin Trusty, Charlie, let's, let's talk about him. Scored again this weekend for Birmingham City. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think he's got an outside chance? Because I feel like Tim Ream is the guy we're going to bring back in, and Austin Trusty just might have to sit it out until 2026. Yeah, I think Tim Ream is definitely ahead of Austin Trusty. Tim Ream's playing every match in the Premier League and, and a, a Fulham team that's getting results. So if you have the captain of a, of a Premier League team who's playing every week and 
are, has already been in the system and Greg feels comfortable with them and knows that he's only going to add value, whether it's off the field with experience and managing guys and talking to them, or in, in, in this case, being on the pitch and playing alongside Walker Zimmerman because he you finally have a left a, le, a center back with a left foot playing on the left center back position. So I know Austin Trusty can play there, but he's not great with his feet. That's the that's the knock on Austin Trusty is building out of the back, good with his feet, touches. When you talk about challenging and aerial duels and set pieces and being someone who can obviously take advantage of offensive set pieces, that's Austin Trusty. But in terms of what Greg wants to do, center back's confident on the ball. He's not there yet. Now he's making, I think, huge strides playing every week. Well, I think the counter to that is, well, he throws Aaron Long out there, who we could argue have the same, or when he's at his peak. Well, right now, for sure, okay. right? But I think that's what is keeping him from being in this conversation with, with Greg Berhalter. You know, it's great that he's playing. He's he's. I think he's been one of the best uh, defensive players in the championship this season. So he's he's making performances and he's doing it well, but in Greg Berhalter's mind, there's a lot of guys uh, ahead of Austin Trusty. I mean, definitely Tim Ream. Uh, I'd say Eric Palmer Brown's ahead of him. I'd say Mark McKenzie for sure is ahead of him. So in the depth chart, probably just misses. So so then Heath, who are your four center backs? Are you leaving Aaron Long out? You got Tim Ream in. Like where no. where are you now? We're, we're I mean, getting really I, close. We're, we're eight days I'm bringing, or nine days away from the I'm bringing roster more. I, I'm bringing more than four. You're bringing five. I'm bringing five. Who's your five? Uh, give us your updated five. I'm gonna go with. Um, and who's starting for you against Wales? No, dude, you got now. You're. I, now I'm you're asking just being a jerk. Now you're just being a jerk. I'm, I'll, I'll, like, I'll, I'll, I know I'll, what you're hey, doing. I'm not afraid who's to your, throw out mine. Cameron okay, Carter Vickers is starting alongside Zimmerman for that first game against Wales. Mm. Well, you might have to because Kiefer mm. Moore, by the way, just the guy's an absolute monster, like 6'5 for Wales. Just scored two goals against Tottenham this past weekend for Bournemouth. And he is looking like he's in good form. He also scored against Belgium in one of their last national team games. I'm just throwing that out there. So Cameron Carter Vickers could be a, a good straight up matchup for him. Go ahead, uh, Heath. Sorry. Chris Richards, I don't think he's going. Um, no, nah, he's out. Yeah, he's out. Uh, he's out. I think you're going to see Tim Ream. I think it's just a logical thing that. It's the worst case scenario that happened for Greg that he thought he had some other looks. Then you've had now two injuries that would have replaced that. But now you're looking at it as actual strength of somebody just that's around. Now, whether Tim Ream plays or not uh, is going to depend on the style of play. Now, if we're not going to be a high-pressing team, then I think Tim Ream starts next to Walker Zimmerman in the first game. If we're going to be a high-pressing team, I think I think it Please, is. I think it is. We're playing play. Wales. Who starts? Who's starting center back? <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Don't give me the if this, if that. Okay. If uh, then Who is? Uh, but you know that's what it is. So I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Tim Ream and Walker Zimmerman are starting at center back. So so we're not pressing high against Wales. I think you still do. I think you can find that that sweet spot. What one thing I, don't I know actually what we're doing. I, I, don't I agree know what we're with doing. Heath. I agree with like, Heath. I you, think, with, you think Ream's starting? He's I the think starter. He, yeah, I do. And and okay. one of the biggest reasons I don't is think you're going plays. with Cameron Carter Vickers. And I don't think. think and then why? by the way, my my five are are those: Cameron Carter Vickers, uh, Walker Zimmerman. Um, um, Tim Ream. Um, wait, who am I missing here? You know, uh, he's uh, Aaron, oh, Aaron Long. Aaron he's Long's going. Him. And and then it's going to come down to Eric Palmer Brown or, or, or uh, Mark McKenzie. I think McKenzie. I'll take McKenzie. And right now, I think, I think McKenzie has the edge because, yes. again, Mark McKenzie was just playing. I don't think, I don't think that cha- moves the needle enough. But his team is winning. And I think that we always see a different version of a player when their team is winning. They're getting good results. And, and they have that level of confidence, right? That 5 to 7% of like, speed of play, that belief that you can make the big play, that simplification of your game when you have to, like those types of things inform, especially when your team is doing well. I think in, for Greg too, it, 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 playing uh, the team's success, I think is an important part for him as well. So those are the five that I have. I don't think we're going to take four because I don't think we have the freedom to take four. I think I think yeah, this no, is the one that. place where it's like stack up because I don't think Greg is looking at it going like, I've got the perfect answer, but I think Tim Ream starts in the first game. All right, I, give me your give me your resident center back. Give me your five and give me your starters. I, I'm mine are the same as Heath, and I got Tim Ream and Zimmerman as well. I think that the relationship that Tim has, given his sharpness with – sorry, let me say this. His relationship with Anthony Robinson I think is important, mm-hmm. that he's doing it week in it's and week out at a high level, under a ton of pressure, high-pressure situations. They know how each other move when the ball is in certain areas of the field. That's very hard to replicate through a couple trainings or, or a friendly game with the national team. So is so that I think, you're starting? Is that you're starting to for each game then? You think I'm just starts- saying against Wales, against Wales, 
You think I got, he changes I, against England? Because in my mind, potentially, you would go, you'd stick with that partnership, right? Because you I, want well, that you could. chemistry. It, well, and also they also Robinson and Ream in particular face off against a lot of the English national team players. Yes. So, so I think there's some value there. Um, my my concern with Cameron Carter Vickers, and we didn't really talk about it last week because we had Gio Reyna on. Shout out to him for coming back, uh, coming on the show. Was against Shakhtar Donetsk in the Champions League or Europa League? No, Champions League. Celtic. Uh, they, that, that's when Shakhtar had that crazy miss, right? Yes. The guy missed a sitter from no time. Cameron Carter Vickers takes a huge risk to try to tackle Mudrick in the middle of the fields, and he misses, and that leads to what should have been a goal. And and I don't know if it got talked about enough, but that scares me that that's the decision he was going to make in that moment where that could completely cost your team. Now, obviously Celtic are chasing the game, you know, whatever they're trying. Well, that was one, that was one, one at that point. They're obviously <laughs> trying to win at home and all that stuff. But, but that, that decision-making in that moment, that, that scared me a little bit about CCV. And, and obviously we can't make those mistakes. That's why we got five backs. guys going. Cause all those guys right, right, right. in the last camp made those same mistakes. I agree. In the national I agree. Team. Uh, so, so that's what I would go with. I think that the the relationship there would be good. I think that uh, obviously Tim's experience, his passing of the ball also helps. He's going to be the best passer that we have. I would have Zimmerman on the right and the desk on, on, on the outside back. You got Tyler Adams in front and about that's to rip a, his wig off. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good five. Listen, I, I'm a, CC I, I, man. we went from this guy was no, no longer in the pool. I get it. So all of a sudden he's now starting. Dude, the guy's playing the best yeah. of his career and, and not even the best of his career. I just say the most consistent in his career. He's now, just who I trust the most. I don't care about anything other than the trust coming into the world cup. Not Austin. Trust. <laughs> I, I will say listen, about trust. <laughs> I, I, I did watch, watch. I watched the Everton game. Yeah. The full Everton. Like I sat down, put my phone down, put the laptop down, stop paying attention to the kids. I'm like, I'm going to watch Tim Ream for 45 minutes here and just watch him watch Anthony. Anthony ended up being man of the match for Fulham in that game and the zero zero draw against Everton. So that was cool for him. I thought he did a lot on both sides of the ball. I think his discipline defensively is getting a lot better under manager Marco Silva, but there was one play that stood out for me that gave me some, some pause for, for Tim Ream. Dominic Calvert-Lewin did an excellent job and Everton did an excellent job of kind of finding that space in behind Tim Ream. And this is early in the first half. And Tim is now trying to scramble to get back into the play. Dominic, they're now in the box. Calvert Lewin does a little shimmy completely. I mean, Tim Ream's out like tackles or tries to slide tackle, misses. And now Calvert Lewin is in coming into goal. Now nothing comes out of it, but that's another instance, just similar to what I said with Cameron Carter Vickers, where all right, you know, they're they're this is what concerns me. If we're going to play a high line, Charlie, then then that's going to lead to play. more teams he can't looking play. to that. He but, cannot play. But, but listen, if Wales is going to throw Kiefer Moore up there, I know he's going to run the channels, but I think that's a that's a guy that Ream can anticipate and keep that spacing good. But if they run a Dan James up high or a Gareth Bale up high, then then I think that we could get exposed for the lack of speed if we're playing a, a high line. And I don't think Gareth that we Bale would has not speed. ran over the top. In but he can, years. dude. But he can. But he, he can. I know. He but he he stays no checking. World Cup. They haven't been in the World stays Cup for checking in the years. midfield. <laughs> dude, <laughs> I stay checking. He stays checking. Okay. He stay <laughs> checking. Go ahead, now, Charlie. You get see that you JB see Davies here. out of here with that team Ream. I'm telling you, Tim Ream's going to the World Cup. Yeah, he's going. But starting, I don't think he starts that first game. You 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 put in Cameron Carter Vickers, you play high. They don't have too many threats in terms of speed. I mean, Gareth Bale, but you can't rely on him because you he's can run Dan James. Week. Dan James can run, dude. Nah, but, but he can be Tyler running. Adams can put him field. in the back pocket. Well, uh, I hope that happens. Recovery speed. Okay. Against England, you sit back. You 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 drop deep. You start with a low block. Tim Ream is gold with low block. No space in behind. You're not having him cover on the sidelines. That's, fine. That's, fine. That's where you sit him. You go, okay, we'll play Tim Ream. And then look, we got a center back who can play on the counter, who can play through the lines. That's when you you have Tim Ream. That's that, in my opinion, if you're gonna do it, you do it that way. Okay, that's fair. Hmm. I'm cool with that. Stop playing with my heart. I'm not I'm not gonna play there. You know what we are gonna do though? We're gonna take our first and only break of in soccer. We trust Get me heated in here. Woo! And we'll no, be third. The guy that's supposed to be super chill will hopefully be super chill. Right after this, obviously, we have a whole bunch of stuff to continue to get into with our player pool. And MLS Cup Final now has two adversaries. The two number one seeds are in the MLS Cup Final. First time that's happened wow. in 2003. We'll break wow. that down. LAFC taking on the Philadelphia Union. So do not go anywhere, everybody. We'll be right back.
The UEFA Champions League on Paramount Plus. Nine months of heart stopping, hold your breath, acceleration. That's brilliant. With more magic and more drama. While a former Bavarian nails the back of the net in Barcelona, an American trades his stars with zebra stripes, and a Norwegian creates sky blue spectacles. Oh, so stream every sweat, so second of regulation time, stop his time, and extra time. Beyond magnificent. This is the best of the best of the best. This is the UEFA Champions League. Stream every match live exclusively on Paramount Plus. Welcome back to It's Talking We Trust. I'm Jim, or is that these 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 guys like to call me? Uh, I'm here with Chuck and Hollywood, and hey, we shout are out excited. All the YouTubers, all the YouTubers out there, you, you all on my side. I love y'all. <laughs> you guys see the game. Let's go. All right. Why why am I suddenly attracted to Charlie? <laughs> says Dan. Oh, this is looking you know. good. Mm. If you can't see this, you're just listening right now. Go over to our YouTube channel, hit subscribe while you're there, and take a look at what Charlie is wearing. Very, very uh, attractive. Sailor Moon Heath Pierce looking good with his wig. For those that can't see me, I got the Spartan spirit. I'm wearing the Will Ferrell outfit that he wore for the Spartan cheerleaders and SNL. So a little throwback to that. I will post a routine that I did with my pal at a Halloween party this past weekend. Can uh, I can't, I can't dance. You, like I got, what? I, I'm not energy. seeing energy, what? no cheers, no energy. Like you got, you're a cheerleader and you, you've I, given us nothing. Well, well, because I, I'm, 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 I'm getting Don't upset. Disrespected a little All bit. All right, here we hmm. go. Hmm. Yes, <laughs> definitely, definitely disrespected. Okay, so let me just talk uh, about the rest of the player pool, and then Heath, I'll come to you on, on any players that maybe stand out for you. Joe Scally, ninety minutes in a two-one loss to Union Berlin, who ended up scoring late, like the ninety-seventh minute, to stay on top of the Bundesliga. Anthony Robinson, I said, man of the match. Gio Reyna, twenty-nine minutes as a sub. Uh, Pulisic started two games this week, two-one win versus Salzburg, and assist to Havertz. Havertz had a lot of work to do, but. Uh, Still had to create that space to make it happen. He's had 79 minutes this past weekend against Brighton. Grant Potter's returned to his former club, and they got slapped around 4-1 by Brighton. Well played to Roberto De Cherby for getting his first win as Brighton coach. Uh, Ricardo Pepe, 90 minutes, 0-0 draw. Uh, who else did I missed? Sean Johnson, 90 minutes in goal and 3-1 loss to Philly. Horvath, 90 minutes and a 1-1 draw versus Sunderland. We had Zach Steffen, 2-1 loss to Preston North End. Both goals on set pieces. Players in front of him couldn't really clear it, and uh, he's trying to react. Couldn't get to either one of them. The one that I really want to, well, at least for me, maybe focus on Jordy Pifak, who played for 60 minutes against uh, uh, Munchen Gladbach and for Union Berlin. He's got eight games now without a goal. And against Gladbach, 59 minutes, 10 touches, no shots. Uh, against Braga in the Europa League, 63 minutes, eight touches, one shot. He just has slowed down a little bit. And I want to know, I guess you can talk about any of those players, but I do want some thoughts on Jordy Pifak and, and I, I want to bring him. He should be on the team for a whole bunch of different reasons because he gives us a different look than the other guys, but, but he was never going to be a starter for us, or at least in my humble opinion, unless it really made sense to make that happen. But, but, uh, that drop in form, not really the best timing for that. It's not, I mean, I still think that he provides something different. And we have the luxury of 26 players. And so I think it would be foolish to not bring him in the case that you get that little uh, butterfly in your stomach that just tells you to go and put him on the field and see what he can do. Or something clearly presents itself in terms of how he can be. If you wanted to throw two players up top for a final 10 minutes instead of you know taking one, taking Ricardo Pepe off and, and putting him in, what if you had them in together? What if you switch to something like that? I think he just provides mm -hmm. something different, even, even not having that level of, of form. He's proven he can score. Yes, we know he's missed big chance for the U.S. men's national team before. We know that kind of stuff. But he's one that just makes too much sense for me. The other one that I, I, I'm, I'm liking more and more is Joe Scali continuing to get really crucial minutes uh, just in terms of his ability to make the roster. Now, whether or not he's ready, we saw that he in in in, the, in some of the minutes that he did play in the last camp, he looked more comfortable. Obviously, circumstances were different. He was getting the ball higher up the field and things like that. Um, but that's another one that I think continues to be. So, so whose you know, spot is he a, taking? If Joe Scally comes in, who is it? Reggie Cannon, DeAndre Yedlin, like who's he spot? Or are you taking all of those guys? I think I think you can have him as a. I mean, that's a good question. I think Reggie Cannon, um, but but you still have. It gives you. Depth and cover instead of a Sam Vines with Serginho Dest and him, it gives you just a, a, a more a, a bigger comfort on that left hand side if you need it, sure. uh, based on circumstance, right? If you don't want to say and change Serginho Dest, 
you can have him cover there. If you don't, if you do, then you have some some depth or cover if DeAndre Yellen's going to start. I think he's depth. I think he's the furthest in in the depth chart for left and right back. But I think that versatility allows you to say, okay, at least we have two backup options at left back, um, and now we have two backup options at right back if we needed it. If you needed to start to shuffle those players around. Okay, resident number nine, Charlie Davies, Frankie Haduk look alike. Totally peaceful, man. What's so? What's going on with you, Jordy P. Falk? Any thoughts on any of the players that discussed? Ricardo Pepe didn't score. I'm a little disappointed. He didn't do anything. <laughs> Not that he didn't do anything. He's obviously putting in the work, and I'm happy he's getting 90 minutes as opposed to sitting on the bench at Augsburg. But uh, give us your and thoughts. And he stays on for 90, even when they're not yeah. winning. They sub out Florian Kruger and they leave him on the field, which means he's like earned this this right That's to stay what I'm on the field. Saying, dude. Game. I'm, you know what I'm saying? I'm, saying, I'm just going to... He's gonna, back. I mean, he's back. He's back. Yeah. He's back. He's well, back. I've been vibing. And you know what? I think I'm just going to go with my guy up top right now is uh, Ricardo Pepe. Just because he's like, he's in the zone, man. And when you're in the zone, you're riding the wave. So p Folk, I think, has to go. Because just in terms of changing the system, because he cannot play by himself. That is a fact. High pressing... Running in behind, he can't do it by himself. That's not his game. He needs someone around him. And when you change a system for whatever it can be, then that's when you're playing with two strikers. So I think you need to bring him in just because his profile is so, so different. Bring him in. Mm -hmm. Pepe's playing, he's getting better, and he's improving on all areas of his game. The guy's in form. He's confident again. We've seen what he can do with the U.S. Men's National Team in World Cup qualifying. He's going. Jesus Ferra has always been Greg's guy because, he, you know, even before World Cup qualifying, there were those moments where he said, I believe in Jesus. He's doing really well. He went through a, a long slump, got back into the game, and then he got confident. But he's not playing as a nine with Dallas. He drops too deep. He's playing as a 10. He's playing as a withdrawn striker. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's not what this U.S. Men's National Team needs from Jesus Ferra. He needs to be high up the field. He needs to be playing off the center back shoulders, occupying two, if not one. He's not doing that right now. And he hasn't done it with FC Dallas for, for the past month or so, two months. And he's out of uh, now out of form because now he's just training. So I think for me, Ricardo Pepe's your starting striker come Wales. Jesus Ferrer is a good option to have when, you know, you need somebody to drop in between the lines to create some more space, try and pull the center back out of, out of that area. And then you have your wingers running in behind. But for me, that's, that's how we're going. And then Josh Sargent is, if he's fit, you you can bring him in if you want to bring four strikers. But I think right now it's Pepe, Ferreira, P Folk. Okay. Sergeant's your fourth. If you if Greg decides to bring four or he sticks with three and wants to add that other player to, to a midfielder or 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 a center back, whatever that may be, because we know Tyler Adams, he's not moving. He's playing 90 minutes. Eunice Musa, he's playing 90 minutes. Now McKinney out, you bring Gio Reyna. I don't know if Gio Reyna could play three games, 90 minutes. I, I, I would bet against that. So that's where Brent Aronson can come in. Christian, you expect him to play three games, start. Does he play 90 minutes? That's up for debate. And then Timo Weah probably can't play 90 minutes for three games. So now you start figuring out who are the guys I'm going to be subbing and when. And um, I think from that standpoint, you got you have a solid foundation. We uh we need to rename this podcast the Char Coach Charlie podcast. That was really, yeah, hey, really good, man. I'm just here. I'm just here to support you. You know Peace. what I'm saying? It was, it was, it was very good. Love. Unfortunately, it was good. It's, it's very good. Unfortunately, it's too long to post on any social media platforms because you went over the limit. You know what I mean? Charlie, <laughs> he did. He went over. Wait, no, there. even with like the new you know? one. Yeah, like, I feel you're already you're already speak you're already speaking in 0.25 speed. So you got to you got to say less words, Bro, man. If it is my bad. <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah, All right, my bad. No, no, it was great. It's great insight, and I I want more Coach Charlie. <laughs> I'll, I'll speed it up. <laughs> you know uh so so uh let's talk then about the mls playoffs playoffs we had mls conference finals happening the final four if i remember correctly i had lafc and philly in the final so i'm feeling great about so myself did I. so okay, did i so did he so he's feeling great about himself i don't think charlie did though it's unlucky for you charlie but before we get into that i uh, want to give a dude what? i, I had lafc winning what? bro i'm still in it you're still in it but you didn't have yeah. the finalists that's all are you going oh, to LA for the final? I'm going to be there. I'm going to make it. Oh, wait, Charlie, you? you're not still in it. I, yeah, I'm going to. I'm, Are you going to go, I'm Charlie? Here. Yeah, I'm we're here. all going to be yeah. on the same <laughs> place. Oh, <laughs> That's unbelievable. Whoa. Let's go. Whoa, bro. <laughs> bro. Bro. I'm like tweaking. <laughs> uh, but Charlie, I've got some bad news. You're not in it still because I had LAFC and Philly in the final. 
yeah. And LAFC and, winning. And LAFC to win it. Yeah, Sorry, so bro. I'm out. Yeah, all right, cool. <laughs> all right. You're out. <laughs> you can still come, though. I still want you we're to come to the game. There. You know, we're, all like, gonna, thanks, we're all going to be there, bro. We'll have to Whoa. take a photo to memorialize it, you know? Yeah. Anyway. Appreciate you, though. All right. As we get into this MLS Cup final preview, I want to say soccer.com. Thank you uh, for for sponsoring this segment. If you want to rep your team for MLS Cup, go over to Soccer.com's Gold Club loyalty program. You get a $5 membership, and that will give someone up to 10% off every order for life. So go make that happen. And a shout-out to Soccer.com. Go get your gear on Soccer.com for this, especially if you support LAFC or the Philadelphia Union. So let's get into their games. Heath, you were at... The LAFC Austin FC game at the Bank mm -hmm. of California. That was a 3 0 win for LAFC. There was a shout for some penalty for Austin FC. I understand why they would be upset about that, but on the balance, LAFC deserved to win the game. I thought the tactics from Steve Chirundolo and his squad were, were perfect. They had basically their wingers running from outside in behind the center backs that were getting sucked in. And it worked every single time. Like, when does Austin? Can it ever adjust? I, it can't all be on the coach who can only do so much from the sideline. How the players mm -hmm. didn't recognize mm -hmm. that, and it just happened over and over and over again. Austin did make some adjustments at halftime, of course, but but at that point, the game was over, and and it was clear there was only one team in charge. What did it look like being there, even though you probably had to pay attention to your daughters at the same time? No, I just gave them popcorn and Skittles, and like that <laughs> held them up until the, until the crash started to happen, and then I had to give them attention. Out of the again. year award. Uh, yeah, for sure. I think the game the game was at noon, so just so you guys know, I was giving him Skittles for breakfast, basically, uh, when I gave <laughs> to him. But uh, I think outside of the first, like, Austin looked really good for the first sort of five to ten minutes, and then yeah. same with the start of the second half. They looked like they found a little bit of rhythm. They pinned uh, LAFC back a little bit and kind of forced LAFC, and then LAFC just sort of figured it out in both halves. So I agree. The the the, the penalty shot would have gone to 2-1, and, you know, then you speculate on momentum shifts and all those things, but by and large, I think that was a game that was that was um, very much um, deserved to be won by by LAFC. But they have they have a number of different threats. And uh, speaking of like injuries and stuff, when Kellen Acosta went down at one point, I was just like, oh no! Like every time I'm seeing an American player go down, I'm just like wor thinking the worst. But turns out it was nothing. But um, that game itself was just a really good game. LAFC just sort of. Yeah, they're just a really good team, and they can beat you. Adding Denis Buanga, I think, is a, a complete game changer for them because now they have um, just somebody that can run at you and beat you one on one on the other side. He was He's a little a bit, I think, I think he was a little too selfish at times yesterday, but in, ends mm -hmm. up um, should have had should have had a goal at the end. That was obviously not should have had. It was called back um, because of offside, but but um, just a completely different dynamic within this team. And now they've got, you know, uh, uh, Mahalo Poku off the bench that gives them that same sort of Denis Buanga willing to stretch teams, one run at teams off of the bench. And so there's just so many ways that they can beat you. Chiellini starting in this game when I didn't expect him to coming shocked? out at halftime. I, think, I, think I was shocked. I was, I was shocked. Started. I was shocked that he started. But if you watched him match up, like – he went through a challenge at one point, and this is oh has yeah, that, that one right was at, like right at midfield. I thought red card maybe because it, of he got the, the ball first though. Yeah, yeah he got no, the but ball at, first. At first. I was like, oh. But when I see that challenge, and I see the way that he matched up, he won all of his aerial duels. He was so I just watched him because I was actually behind him most of that first half, where you could see his nudges and bumps that got him into positions that where he could win the ball, where he didn't have to out physicality somebody. But that challenge at the half line to me was like that was the in indicator of his quality because I think most players would have been late to that challenge. And either you're talking about a yellow card or a red card or a potential breakaway, somebody with pace. And he went through that. That was basically like, I'm going to break this person in half, or I'm going to break myself <laughs> in half. And, and he ends up getting the ball and it's an unbelievable challenge. But that to me was like the sign that this team has the quality to win this game. And I know it's a small thing and it's stupid to, to talk about, but when you watch somebody like that, who's a leader, make a play that that was that big, uh, in that moment, it just showed, again, the buy-in from a player like him that he has in that moment. And yeah, they deserve to win it. So I'll, I'll get off my pedestal now. But I'm excited about uh, MLS Cup Final against Philadelphia Union. Yeah. It's, wait, 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 it's, who it's who amazing. do you have winning? Well, I've got LAFC your, winning. I know, but I know you had it in your bracket. But in this game, you think they, they still at home. It's close. Blowout. PK. Oh, it's, it's close. It's going gonna, it's it's gonna to be close, close for sure. Yeah. Um, and finals always generally suck. I'm just going to put that out there um, because teams play a little bit more more reserved. But L I mean, I think I think 
Philly <laughs> Union before they yeah, went maybe, up. Maybe I don't more, want to go to the game anymore, Heath. Thanks for yeah, yeah. feeling my spirit. <laughs> yeah, Please. give me if, if, guys, if the game's <laughs> oh, the game's gonna Philly. suck. Yeah, the game's go ahead, the game's gonna it. suck. Go so it, if you have tickets and you want to give them to me, I'll take them instead. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, you man, I was all excited in. to come, no. and now like he's like, the game's well, like, gonna you know, suck because finals like they, suck. They, they <laughs> just generally them. aren't that. You know, like no, you're gonna bring the energy, Jimmy. However, I I will say that when I look at the two games. Philly Union's vulnerabilities that they 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 were a little bit exposed at times, like they showed some weaknesses in a, in a way that I think LAFC really didn't. LAFC run the risk of set pieces against, um, like any team does. But outside of that, they're they're they were pretty they're complete. Really I think Philadelphia Union yeah. showed some ineffectiveness at times that that I think could be could be capitalized on. Again, it's it's a one off game and it's a final, so you Andre play differently. Blake, but though. yeah. Andre yeah, Blake for sure. Man. Goalkeeper Andre can always Blake. make a difference. I, I'll say this very quickly about LAFC. When I look at their lineup, and because they be, are becoming a lot more dangerous on both sides, not just a Carlos Vela show. You got Buanga, you got uh, Arango up top, who's you know, obviously scored the first one on set pieces. Good to see them scoring set pieces again. And then they're just the, the midfield. Ilya Sanchez, excellent player. Uh, Kellen Acasa, obviously hitting some good set pieces in and, and uh, will give you all, all the work that you need there. Sefuentes does a really good job of joining the attack late. And then you have a nice, solid, steady back four, whether Chiellini's in there or not. And Crepo is making the saves that he should make. They're just really, really balanced. And I think that they probably, obviously, playing at home too, have a slight edge in the final. Now let's switch over then to, to Philly versus NYCFC because it was a, a basically a flip the script from the year before where Philly scored first in this game in the conference final. And then NYCFC scored a couple goals late to book their ticket to MLS Cup. Now, this time around, Maxi Morales, cute as a button, Maxi Morales scored a very good goal to go up 1-0, and they couldn't hold on to the lead. And then the oh, freight train known as Philly Union collapsed. turned it on to another level that I was like, if they can, if they can, what, three goals in 11 minutes. And if Philly can, can I know they can't keep that up over 90, but if they can bottle that up and, and bring that type of energy for a good portion of their game against LAFC, I give them a good chance in the final. Philly, uh, what are I you agree. saying, Charlie, about this game? I say... Hear ye, hear ye. <laughs> what are you, uh, what no. character is that? What is this character? <laughs> Jeez Louise, Charlie. How many how many parties do you have to go to tonight? Yeah, you know? <laughs> last, last night, hear last night I wanted you a, have haunted, a, beard. a haunted, yeah, uh, haunted walk through my town. And, and the town I live in, you know, 1635 was founded. So they, they were going through all the yeah, it's haunted revolutionary as it is. Yeah, guys it. and haunted. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. we had the hear ye, hear ye oh, ghost. Yeah. But um, yeah. no, I think the union, Mikhail Ua, just it wasn't that good on the ball last night and Carranza Julian Carranza stepped up I mean talk about a signing that has changed the, the game for the for the union playing with two strikers Corey Burke comes in and the ball's bouncing off his shin off his feet and he he knows how to how to make an entrance and he's an impact because he's just so tough to handle but when I look at this union team they they're great in transition but when you can control the tempo and I think what LAFC did against Austin was Let's dictate the tempo. We're going to con take control of this game. That's how you beat the union. And at home, I feel LAFC are going to have the, the possession, which Philadelphia Union are fine with. They try and just expose you when they can, and they are aggressive in their, their press. But once you beat that press, LAFC controls the game, slows down the tempo, and that neutralizes the union quite a bit. So I think from that standpoint, LAFC are, are, are well-suited to win this game at home. What's interesting is... Philadelphia Union had 34% possession in a home game at home, you know, to book their ticket to MLS mm -hmm. Cup. They're very comfortable with not having the ball. And then obviously they can be devastating on the counter. In and when you bring a Corey Burke off of the bench and when you're tired a little bit, I could see how that could be impactful. I just wonder if Jim Curtin, the manager of Philly, might utilize him sooner if the game's a little bit more. Let's say in the balance per se, because he brought him in when they were still trying to go on and, and win the game. But but go once ahead. they got one though, Jimmy, like you could feel that confidence the they have that's baby. making yeah, them yeah. score that's crazy true. amounts of goals this year, where they score one and then like all of a sudden everybody becomes automatic from anywhere. And it's pretty crazy. Yes. Like if they get one, LAFC are not beating uh but, but think of think of that poor substitution from New York City FC last night, the timing of that on the set yeah, piece, yeah, and then boom, goal, and then it was done. So I think the coaching is is one area of of what kind of brought NYCFC down this year is is the the lack of ideas at times or poor timing with with substitutions or um not putting players in the right position to succeed. I think towards the end of the year 
he started to to implement the guys in the right spaces. Santi Rodriguez is a phenomenal player. And then you look at Gabby Pereira, how they were able to work well together. But last night, Gabby Pereira had an off night. And then he, he just, once they got that goal, you can't make the substitution on a set piece. Yeah. Yeah. That's... Boom. You know what I'm saying? I know. And then it cha changes the Far game. Far out. It's changes over, the game. dude. Changes the game. Anyway, that segment was brought to you by Soccer.com. So make sure you rep your team and go to Soccer.com right now. And uh, why don't you join the Gold Club? Get some loyalty there. It's a $5 membership, and it'll give someone up to 10% off for life every order. That is pretty ridiculous. Soccer.com. We'll make that happen. It's top Ooh. top place to go, Let's bro. Let's go. Soccer.com has everything that you need and then some, but make sure you want to rep your favorite MLS team, especially the ones in the MLS Cup final. LAFC versus the Philadelphia Union. That's kicking off this Saturday. We'll obviously preview it a little bit more as it gets closer in one of our podcasts on Friday. All right, boys. Final thoughts? As we tie up this show to start the week on Halloween, Heath, I'll come to you first. Final thoughts. What do you got for us? I was just thinking about this. Uh, what if the U.S. did what Romania did and everybody bleached their hair the same color before this World Cup? Uh, I, I would be hyped. Through the, through the idea hyped. of costumes. I would like be they just made this hyped. like crazy statement everybody went with pink hair or blonde hair or whatever. Like somebody, like uh, imagine just like the, like I feel like that was like, Think about it now, through the lens now. What about like the R9 Ronaldo haircut? Like the R9 Ronaldo. Little... I do. I do. Uh, I do. <laughs> they couldn't pull I, that I off. They couldn't pull that you off. You know, you know, Walker is not cutting that the, the, <laughs> the locks true. off. Okay. But blonde, give it to me. All. Well, we like don't. Bleach we don't. Blonde. Bleach blonde. Eunice Musa, bleach blonde. Oh. We firework. don't have any. We don't have any right Swag. now. Looking at this team, we don't have any bald players. Is which that a means, first? Is that a first? <laughs> which, means, which means you could do we, the hair. We could do we the hair as there, hell. You know? <laughs> we young, like we young as hell. You couldn't do uh Michael Bradley at a certain point. You know what I mean? Like you had like so, you wouldn't so you're saying to, that, Hey, but Blake like, Blake Greg Berhalter Blake couldn't get involved in this. A great point in the YouTube comments. He said, "Then we look stupid if we lose. If we got blown out and everybody's blonde hair, oh. <laughs> oh I'll tell you, you that right now. And you shave it the next for hey, the next game you shave it. Yeah, no no one cares. You know what I mean? Like I look sick when I go golfing, <laughs> but I lose every time I go golfing, you know, yeah, but people yeah. are only going to remember it's different. Like, that it's one different. guy. You, you look good, know. you play good. It's part of what, it. You got to win the that's world right. cup. Romania didn't. You got to get out of the group with blonde hair though. I'll tell you that right <laughs> oh, now. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. True. That's, that's a good true. final thought. How about you, Charlie? Final thought. Yeah, that was a hell of a final thought. Halloween. That's, it. that's, it. that's your final thought. Charlie left it. Man, Charlie actually is, I think, fully <laughs> invested in this character because there was a long silence after he made that that statement right now that I'm just like, I think he's catching up with his thoughts. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm just hyped that we're all going to be in L.A. together, bro. Yeah, yeah. I'm hyped oh, as well. That's let's gonna ride be some waves. Level. That's, we, might have to do, we might have to do an emergency live podcast from MLS yeah. Cup. That would, be, that would be next level. Just throwing that out there for producer Alex and producer Dez to think about. All right, my final thought, I want to give a shout out to Sophia Smith. She won MVP for the NWSL and then followed that up with a woman of the match performance in the final as the Portland Thorns beat Kansas City Current 2-0. She scored the match winner. What a season that she's had for both club and country. And I just want to give her a shout out. Also, if you don't know about our sister podcast, Attacking Third here in the CBS Sports family, make sure you follow it. Uh, Sandra Herrera and Lisa Roman are absolutely killing it there. And they've had a tremendous season shout out to Lisa. following all that. So I just want Jimmy, to give them a go. shout out. Shout out hey, to yeah, let's go. Do your, give, do your give, cheer, Jimmy. Come give on. Give people what they want. Jack yeah, from your fingers. Let's go. Cheer fingers. No. Come what are you talking about? Time. Where's your, where's your mic? What? Defense. Defense. Defense, 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 defense. defense. All right, everybody, thank you for listening in Soccer with Trust. <laughs> we we'll see you next time. We love you guys. <laughs> Subscribe. Subscribe. Bro. Bro.